Welcome in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who follows us to take courage and follow him. We begin our worship today in singing our opening hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The intuit for today is from Psalm 2, with antiphon from Isaiah chapter 42. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with the rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. We continue with the Kyrie. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory, for Jesus Christ, who we saw.
be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, mercifully look upon our infirmities and stretch forth the hand of your majesty to heal and defend us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the third Sunday in Epiphany is taken from Jonah, chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. St. Paul writes, This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it for the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Praise to you, O Christ. After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and they followed him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for today's message is taken from our Gospel reading from Mark chapter 1 with an emphasis on these words. Jesus said, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. This is our text, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. A boy and his dad were enjoying a family hike on a trail in the woods when, at a narrow pass in the road, they came across a good-sized log from a downed tree which was blocking their way forward. The boy, wanting to be helpful and to impress his old man, said, What do you think, Dad? Can I move it out of the way? Dad surveyed the scene, and he sized up his son, and he said, You know, I think you can just manage if you use all the strength you have. At this, the boy sets his pack down. He approaches the log, and with all of his might, he began to push. But the log didn't budge. Wrapping his arms around it as far as it would go, he squatted, and at the bottom, he tried to lever using his knees, but to no avail. Heaving and panting, the boy then pressed with his shoulder. He turned around and nudged it with his back. He then ran and gave it a big flying kick, but still the log would not move. Frustrated and tired, the boy turned back to his dad and said, Geez, Dad, you told me that I could lift it. What gives? Smiling playfully, his dad replied, No, son, what I said was that you could manage if you used all the strength you had. But then you went on alone, and you didn't even ask me for help. The boy understood his dad's meaning immediately. Combining their strength, the man and his son were able to clear the path. Now the dad's point, of course, was this, that his son's strength was not only his own, Relying on his father for help enabled him to do something that would not have been possible all by himself. I ask you today, friends, have you ever had a job or have you ever been given a task for which you were woefully underprepared? I can't help but wonder if Jesus' disciples felt just this way in our reading today from Mark chapter 1 when the Lord called them to service. After all, as we read Mark's gospel, telling of their call to service, they hardly seem like the most esteemed or theologically astute theologians of their day. Jesus did not find Peter and Andrew and James and John in the local synagogue debating the Torah. No, he found them rather out on the Sea of Galilee, working in their fishing boats. These men were not clergy. They were laity. They were busy at the tasks of the vocations to which they were called when suddenly their Lord, their Messiah, appeared and he issued another call. Follow me, said Jesus, and I will make you become fishers of men. On their part, the disciples' response, we read, was one of courage. Peter and Andrew immediately dropped their nets and they followed him. James and John left their father Zebedee, poor guy, right in the fishing boat with his hired servants, and they too followed him. All of them, seeing the importance of the call that Jesus had issued, dropped what they were doing and they went to attend to the greater work that they'd been given. For me, I look at this text, and I am tempted in my sinful nature to think that these disciples were perhaps just a little foolhardy or in the case of James and John even, a bit selfish in leaving their father with the hired hands. And yet, St. Mark, in his account of the gospel, seems to be writing in order to inspire us to follow in the disciples' steps, to make us respond to the call for service in God's church with courage. However, as we read not just Mark's gospel, but the other three as well, we can see quite clearly that these disciples whom Jesus called were not always men of courage. Later in Jesus' ministry, when on the same Sea of Galilee that these four men were so used to fishing, 
when a large squall threatened to capsize their boat, the disciples would cry out to Jesus in their terror, Lord, do you not care that we are perishing? And in the Garden of Gethsemane, at Jesus' arrest, these same disciples would scatter and go into hiding in order to avoid their rabbi's fate. Peter, on his part, would famously deny Jesus in order to avoid arrest, and Thomas famously would be so distraught over the crucifixion that he would deny the resurrection. To quote J.R.R. Tolkien, the courage of men may, and often does, fail. So then, I ask, what should be our takeaway from reading Mark chapter 1? To be like the disciples, but not be like them at other times? Hmm. Well, what about to follow Jesus? Until it's hard to follow Jesus. Oh, wait, I have it. Have courage. Until maybe those times that you don't have courage. Friends, none of these hit the mark. Allow me to reorient the way that you think about this text and, more broadly speaking, the way that you think about the courage it takes to follow Jesus. Let's start with this statement. This reading from Mark chapter 1 is not, in fact, about the disciples. Service in the church, for that matter, is not about us. It is not our abilities, our strength, or our courage. I pray that you will be relieved this morning to hear that ministry in this congregation is not about you, nor is it about your pastors, for that matter. It is always about Jesus. When Jesus called the disciples, did you catch who it was who was doing the heavy lifting, so to speak? Let's look again. Jesus said, Follow me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. Follow me, Jesus says. I lead, you follow. I'll clear the trail so that you may walk it. And, he continues, I will make you become fishers of men. I who called you, promises the Lord, will equip you. I will give you my strength, my spirit, to put the words in your mouth to minister good news to your neighbor. What's more, that same Jesus also promises, I will die for you so that you will be saved from your sin, so that you will be renewed and remade to carry out this monumental task to which I have called you. The courage in Mark chapter 1 is not the disciples' courage. It is not our courage. It is Jesus's. Jesus would go out to heal the sick, not James. Jesus would drive out demons, not Andrew. Jesus would proclaim liberty to the captives, not John. And Jesus would be lifted up on the cross, not Peter. Oh, but wait a second, Pastor, I hear you say. It turns out, if you read a little bit more, the disciples actually did go on to do all of those things. But friends, remember the lesson of the dad and the boy in the woods. What the disciples accomplished was not merely their own work. Rather, it was the power of God in Christ Jesus, in them and through them, which did such mighty acts of courage. Likewise, dear brothers and sisters, the work done in the church today, here in Bloomington, is not our own work, but it is also Christ's. Christ who calls us to this place, Christ who gives us his gifts, also equips us for the task of ministry throughout our various vocations. For it is the love of God shown in Christ Jesus which we proclaim, which we practice with conviction and courage in our households, our community, and beyond. Fret not over whether you have the right tools or the right qualifications to go and do this task. For you have what the disciples have. You have Christ. And dear Christians, I tell you, 
Christ is enough. Christ's strength will bear you up. Christ's courage is sufficient. A well-known reading from Joshua chapter 1 urges us, Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. This sounds like something that we must do. It sounds like Joshua is giving us some kind of a prerequisite, a certain amount of courage that we must have in order to follow Jesus. But no, Joshua doesn't stop there. This passage ends with encouragement. He would go on to say, For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Dear friends, Jesus calls you to follow because he himself intends to go on ahead of you. He will carry you through trial and temptation. He will enable you to serve him in ways that you never even imagined. For the courage of Christ takes fishermen, and it turns them into apostles. The courage of Christ takes prostitutes and tax collectors and Pharisees, and it turns them into disciples, servants, and proclaimers. The courage of Christ takes poor, miserable sinners like us, and it turns them into baptized believers. It turns them into pastors, or elders, or deacons, Sunday school teachers, choir singers, ushers, trustees, stewards. By the call of your Lord, you Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you are given to serve in your homes, in your communities, and beyond. Therefore, I urge you this day, as Joshua did, take courage. For Christ the Lord has gone on before you. Follow on the path that his footsteps trod, and he will give you all things needful for the task ahead. Therefore, Go out from this place, wherever you are called, in the name of Jesus, who has made you his fishers of men. In his most mighty name, amen. May the peace of God, which far surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in the same Christ Jesus, unto life everlasting, amen. Together we make confession of our faith, in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus, and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you desire not the death of a sinner, but that all would repent and believe the gospel. In the epiphany of your Son, your time of salvation and your kingdom have come near. As this world passes away, give faithfulness and urgency to your church to proclaim the gospel of our God to all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of harvest, as you called Simon Peter, Andrew, James, and John to follow you, and made them fishers of men, so send faithful preachers of your gospel in our time. Increase the spirit of generosity to all who support the missionaries, seminaries, colleges, and other institutions of our church for the spread of the gospel and the service of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal Lord, in view of every current distress as the present form of this world passes away, give constancy and contentment to your people in their God-given stations. Give comfort and faithfulness to the married and strengthen them to pass on the faith to the next generation. Show kindness also to the unmarried and assure them of the holiness of their place in life, that they would be freed from anxiety and attend to holiness in body and spirit 
undividedly devoted to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, preserve our nation and its rulers. Call to repentance those who have forgotten you. Spare Joseph, our president, Eric, our governor, and all who serve for the good of this people. Do not let disaster befall us, but preserve us in peace and in quietness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, turn us from every distracting anxiety and the dealings of this world that would draw our hearts away from your blessed gospel and its end, eternal life. Give us confidence in the resurrection and the peace of a clean conscience by the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. Graciously behold and help those for whom we pray. Especially do we lift up Jerry and Jean Albers, Jean Antilla, Pat Ballou, Sybil Cole, Linda Gantz, Betty Jays, Riley Kirkey, Nancy Seitz, Don Weaver, Joe Ziegler, Tom Zimmerman, Dave Beck, Wanda Bullhorst, Tim Crouch, Reverend Jeff Geisler, Ursula Hassan, Paul Walrod, Lynn Byerly, the mother of Christian Schuler, Wendy Absher, the daughter of Deanie Bentley, and all those we name now in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things, and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, dear Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, and who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Thank you.